I mentioned sexual violence in this video, so if you're sensitive to that topic, please consider before watching. The Song of Achilles is a modern partial retelling of the Iliad with a focus on the relationship between Achilles and his, uh, close friend and wartime companion Patroclus. In this version of the tale, Patroclus and Achilles are lovers, and we follow their relationship all the way from when they first meet as children, through the Trojan War, and to their tragic end. Spoilers? I'll say up front, for anyone interested in the books, uh, historical and or mythological accuracy that I'm not an expert on ancient Greek society, nor at the time of writing have I read the Iliad. I'm going to be judging the novel purely on whether I think it's an entertaining read. That being said, I am aware that the homosexual aspect of Patroclus and Achilles' relationship was not explicit in the original Homeric version of the tale. At best, it was implied by how Achilles falls into a deep grief and goes on a homicidal rampage in response to Patroclus' death at the hands of Hector, which seems like a bit of an overreaction to the death of a, uh, close friend and wartime companion. Fascination with just how close Achilles and Patroclus were is about as old as we know the story to be. In fact, written versions of the tale that feature explicit homosexuality between Achilles and Patroclus can be dated back to other ancient Greek authors around the 5th to 6th century BCE. So if you're worried that this modern retelling is just an erotic slash fic, don't worry, the tradition of slash ficking the Iliad is older than... Jesus. <laughs> The novel opens strongly, with Patroclus's father, King Menetius, bringing Patroclus to Tyndareus's court where Helen is being offered as a bride to a selection of royal suitors. Kings from across the land have come to claim her as a bride, and Patroclus is offered up by his father as a suitor despite being nine years old at the time. I actually really loved this scene for both the themes and the tone it sets, which are carried for the rest of the novel. Kings and the gods are the only people afforded any dignity in this rendition of ancient Greece, while all others are treated as their subjects and property. So while Menetius offering his nine-year-old son as a husband to Helen is seen as odd by the other kings, no one objects to it because, of course, Menetius is a king, and it's not technically against the rules, so... Patroclus follows his father's instructions perfectly, but as the tale goes, Helen is given to Menelaus instead, and Patroclus receives no reward nor affection from his father for his obedience. Patroclus is victim to his father's whims in this scene, which sets the stage for the rest of the tale where all mortal men and women are victim to the will of the gods. Many characters in this tale, regardless of their piety, are met with suffering and tragedy, simply because the gods have a plan that, for unexplained reasons, requires death, suffering, tragedy, and men performing acts of sheer abhorrence. Prosehe. <laughs> In a similar vein, Achilles is the son of King Peleus and the minor goddess Thetis. In the original myth, Peleus is ordered by the gods to subdue Thetis until she consents to marry him. In the Song of Achilles, the gods very explicitly command Peleus to rape Thetis, which he, being a pious man, does, and Thetis has a deep hatred for Peleus for that horrific act, and the other gods for willing it upon her. In the story to follow, she does everything within her power to defy the will of the major gods in order to preserve her son, but she and Achilles still nonetheless end up being victims of the fates that the gods have carved out for them. I liked this theme a lot because it taps into something that I think marginalized groups such as LGBT folk will find evocative, that being the feeling that because because of your identity and other factors such as your class, where you happen to live, or the colour of your skin, forces larger than yourself will take control of your opportunities, maybe even your well-being or your life, 
and play havoc with them to your detriment without even giving you the courtesy of fully explaining why. Gods and kings play with the fates of mortals in Greece in the same way that politicians and corporations play with the rights of marginalised people in real life. This particular reading probably wasn't intended by the author, but it's something that entered my mind while I was reading as a possible surface level interpretation of the novel's story and themes that doesn't require the reader to be familiar with the Iliad in order to pass. Viewed through this lens, I actually really loved how the book closes in the final chapter, leaning into the tragedy of the original ballad while providing a subversive spot of optimism. But I won't say exactly how the novel does this, you will just have to read it. It's thematic remixing like this that makes a contemporary retelling of a classical tale worth reading. In a media landscape where remakes, reboots, and retellings are a dime a dozen, seemingly without artistic justification, I can understand if you, as the potential audience, feel apprehensive towards something like this, and I don't blame you for avoiding the novel for that reason. Nevertheless, if you do choose to read the novel on its own terms and judge it as an art or entertainment piece in isolation, I think it's a well told piece of quality fiction and it kept me invested from beginning to end. One common criticism I've seen levied against The Song of Achilles is the writing quality, and I have to agree on that front. On the whole, the writing is flat, although I wouldn't go so far as to say it's bad. It's perfectly competent writing that mostly achieves clarity and moves the story along at a brisk pace. So at first, I interpreted the flatness as a stylistic choice. Taking mythical, larger-than-life events and portraying them as just another day in ancient Greece gives an interesting sense of domesticity to the characters in this fantastical version of the world, where superhuman war heroes are trained by centaurs, and the gods themselves grace the earth with their flesh and blood presence. If this version of the world existed, it's easy to imagine that the characters would probably be similar to how the novel describes them, and Patroclus's narration is how you might imagine someone from that world would tell a story. However, the flat style doesn't carry over well to the latter half, especially after the characters arrive at the beaches of Troy. It's this section of the story where the writing shows its weaknesses the most, as it attempts to describe more action-focused scenes, as well as paragraphs where characters emotions reach their boiling points. That same flat style hinders the vividness of the story and characters and doesn't achieve the same stylistic purpose as it did in the first half of the novel. At its worst, it lets slip in a few contemporary patterns of speech, which some have complained about in reviews, and I certainly noticed this as well, however, they don't occur terribly often. The story is still carried well by its brisk pace and the many conflicts between the characters, which played out with nail-biting tension, even if, being a retelling of a classic tale, I mostly already knew where the story was going to go. For my money, even though the novel's central focus is Patroclus and Achilles, it's actually Thetis who ends up stealing the show. Her arc as a character was genuinely something I was not expecting, and I found it satisfying, thematic, and vividly emotional. I reached the summit, a careless heap of boulders at the cliff's edge, and stood. An idea had come to me as I climbed, fierce and reckless as I felt. Thetis! I screamed it into the snatching wind, my face towards the sea. Thetis! The sun was high now, their meeting had ended long ago. I drew a third breath. Do not speak my name again. I whirled to face her, and lost my balance. The rocks jumbled under my feet, and the wind tore at me. I grabbed at an outcrop, steadied myself. I looked up. Her skin was paler even than usual, the first winter's ice. Her lips were drawn back to show her teeth. You are a fool, she said. Get down, your half-wit death will not save him. I was not so fearless as I thought. I flinched from the malice in her face, but I forced myself to speak, to ask the thing I had to know of her. How much longer will he live? She made a noise in her throat, like the bark of a seal. It took me a moment to understand that it was laughter. Why? Would you prepare yourself for it? Try to stop it? Contempt spilled across her face. Yes, I answered, if I can. 
the sound again. Please, I knelt. Please tell me. Perhaps it was because I knelt. The sound ceased, and she considered me a moment. Hector's death will be first, she said. This is all I am given to know. Hector. Thank you, I said. Actually, the flatness combined with the briskness makes the novel a very easy read, so I'd highly recommend this book to people who prefer more passable literature. Don't confuse passable with simple, however. The story still demands the reader's full attention, as it juggles many names, relationships, and changing and conflicting motivations throughout its narrative. It also doesn't shy away from challenging and potentially disturbing themes, so reader discretion is advised, although by my judgement it handles those themes well for the most part. The Song of Achilles is a good novel and it comes with a genuine recommendation from me. However, I strongly suspect that your enjoyment of this novel is going to hinge far more on your tastes regarding the high-level conceptual elements rather than their execution. So if you like the idea of a gay romance-focused retelling of the Achilles myth that leans into the fantasy elements of its mythological setting and focuses on themes and characters, then it's highly likely that you'll enjoy the novel. However, if if you've listened to this review and you doubt that you'll enjoy this story, then this book probably isn't going to convince you and you can feel free to skip it. The novel was originally published in 2011 and it's relatively well known so it shouldn't be too difficult to track down a copy in stores. I found this book on the shelves at a major bookstore chain in Melbourne and I've also seen copies in several independent outlets as well. If you can find this book in a local retailer, I would highly recommend supporting them by purchasing your copy there. If you have trouble finding the book in stores, I've linked some online retailers in the description of this video that I recommend, including Better World Books, Alibris, and Blackwells. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can help me by doing all the things that help my channel grow, primarily subscribing, clicking the bell, and sharing this video with your friends or on social media. I would appreciate that a lot, and thanks for watching.